Faith, we are so delighted that you have joined us today online. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to lead you and to love you well. We pray that you're all doing well today. I want to invite you this morning to open your Bible to Joshua chapter 1 as we continue our foundation study uh, throughout this year. As you turn there, I want to remind you of a story about a man named Jim Marshall. Uh, Jim Marshall played defense. He was a defensive end for the Minnesota Vikings. In fact, he was one of the defensive uh, team members on the Purple People Eaters. This was a Minnesota Vikings team that won four Super Bowls, and Jim Marshall was an important part of that team. In fact, he started 270 consecutive games for the Minnesota Vikings. That is second only to Brett Favre of the Green Bay Packers of consecutive games started. Uh, Jim Marshall had 127 sacks, which is the second most in Minnesota Vikings history. He also had 30 fumble recoveries, which at the time was an NFL record. But there was one game against the San Francisco 49ers that Jim Marshall will always be known for. There was a fumble and Jim Marshall as a defensive end recovered the fumble and he began to run toward the end zone. And he began to run 10 yards and then he got to 20 yards and 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 yards and he finally ran 66 yards and he ran into the end zone. When he got into the end zone to celebrate his touchdown, he took the football and he threw it into the crowd in celebration. And as he turned around, his teammates informed him of what you might have already guessed. Jim, you ran the wrong way. You ran to the wrong goal line. And so what happened in the case of Jim Marshall was the 49ers got a safety and they got the ball back. And it was an embarrassing moment for him. One of the most historical moments in the NFL's memory. Metaphorically, I'm wondering today if, if we're in a season again where God is handing his people the ball. And he's done this throughout history, but, but maybe this is a time that stands out as more prominent than others. And so the question for us as a church, and the question for us as the people of God is, what are we going to do when God gives us the ball? Specifically, fathers, what are you going to do when faced with adversity that's surely coming our way? Uh, mothers, what are you going to do when the world around you is in panic? Students, what are you going to do when your life is all of a sudden put on hold? Singles, what are you going to do as the community around you that you've enjoyed slowly begins to fade away in isolation? What do we do during times like this as the people of God and as families of God and men and women and children of God and the church of God, what do we do when God hands us the ball? What do we do in the face of adversity? Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 speak to this very scenario. In fact, if you have your Bible this morning, I encourage you to open your Bible and wherever you are, uh, stand up. Maybe you're having coffee or a bowl of oatmeal. Stand up. Let's read the word of God together. Joshua chapter 1. Starting in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land that I am giving the Israelites. And I have given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness in Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, and all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses, and I will not leave you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land that I, I swore to their fathers to give as an inheritance." Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction of my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. And this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. 
Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Would you join me as we pray together? Oh, Father, we pray that we would be faithful. That, Lord, in a time of turmoil and crisis, that we would be steady. And, and Lord, in a time of fear, that we would be people of faith. And so, God, would you move among your people? Would you remind us of our purpose? God, would you fill us with your spirit? And would you help us even in moments like this to reevaluate our priorities? And God, would you encourage and equip us from passages like Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. We pray all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated this morning if you were standing. So the question is, what do we do when God gives us the ball? I believe from Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, first of all, the people of God must choose to remember His faithfulness. Choose to remember His faithfulness. Look again with me at Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1. And the Bible says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. And now you and all the people prepare to cross over to the Jordan, to the land that I am giving to the Israelites. Now I want you to imagine this scene with me. Moses, the, the leader of the people of God for the last 40 years, is now dead. The only leader that the people of God had ever known has now passed away. In fact, in Deuteronomy 34.10, listen to this verse. It records, no prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And so as we've been reading in our foundation study together, we've seen time after time God doing miraculous things through the leadership of Moses. In fact, right now where you are, if you're in your home or you're, you're sharing a home with some friends or family, I want to just give you a moment to talk about all that God had done through Moses. In fact, I want you to answer this question uh, as a group or as a couple or as friends or whoever is currently there. Answer this question. What did God do through Moses' leadership? I'm going to give you 20 seconds to talk about this as a group. Hey, today, if you're just watching alone, if you would text the phone number at the bottom of your screen, we'd love to hear from you about those miraculous things that God has done through Moses. So this is a time of planned interaction to talk to each other. Ready, set, go. Wow, can you just believe all that God did through Moses and his leadership? Can you imagine the sorrow that must have come upon the people of God at Moses' passing as they mourned for him and as they prepared to enter into the promised land? Look back with me at Joshua chapter 1 verse 2. God says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land that I am giving to the Israelites. You see, God was reminding Joshua that Moses wasn't giving the promised land to Israel. God was. In fact, it was him all alone. It was God sending the plagues. It was God defeating the Egyptians. It was God providing manna and water for Israel. It was God who was keeping them alive in the wilderness. It was God who was conquering their enemies. And, it, and although Moses was dead now, God was still faithful to his covenant promises because all along the way, it was a work of God. 
And listen, I, I want to say that, that today when God gives you the ball and when God gives me the ball, we have to, first of all, remember his faithfulness. In fact, I would be sure that in your life, if you are in Christ, that you have experienced the faithfulness of God and maybe even right now. In fact, for just a moment, would you would you do us a favor and would you talk to some people in the room about times that you've experienced God's faithfulness in your life? Would you be willing to share about a time that, that you've seen God's faithfulness in your past? And maybe it was something you were trusting for. Maybe it was a miracle that you were hoping for, but God proved himself faithful. Would you just take a few moments to discuss that with one another? And once again, if you're sitting alone, would you text that to the number at the bottom of the screen? We'd love to hear from you about God's faithfulness in your life. Ready, set, go. Thank you for sharing those stories. Hey, when God hands us the ball, we must remember his faithfulness. Secondly, when God hands us the ball, we must choose faith over fear. Look at Joshua chapter one, verses two through nine again with me. It says, Moses, my servant is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over the Jordan to the land I'm giving the Israelites. I've given you every place where the sole of your foot treads, just as I promised to Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness of Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, and all the land of the Hittites to the west and to the west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, and I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Then he says, be strong and courageous for you will distribute the land that I swore to their fathers to give them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Don't turn from it from the, to the right or to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. And this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And it's in these commands that God tells Joshua that it's now time to enter into the promised land. And I wanna introduce you to a key theme uh, throughout the book of Joshua, found in Joshua chapter 1, I'm sure you noticed it is there repeated many times. In fact, as a general principle in the word of God, when something is repeated uh, many times, that's God's way of emphasizing that for people to read later on. I want you to notice the repetition of me in Joshua chapter 1 verse 6. Be strong and courageous for you will distribute the land that I swore to their fathers. I want you to notice Joshua chapter 1 verse 7. It says, above all, be strong and very courageous. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Haven't I commanded you, says the Lord, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Well, let's just turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 31. We just read some similar commands. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, chapter 31 verse 6. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified of them. 
For the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you and he will not abandon you. In Deuteronomy 31, 7, Moses summoned Joshua and he said to him in the sight of all of Israel, be strong and be courageous for you will go with this people into the land the Lord swore to give their fathers. You will enable them to take possession of it. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 23 says, the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and he said to him, be strong and courageous for you will bring the Israelites into the land that I swore to them and I will be with you. What do we see in, in, this, in this incredible moment where God's people are going to enter into the promised land? God is reminding Joshua. Moses is reminding Joshua. And they're both reminding the people of God that what they're going to need is strength and courage. Over and over and over again. Dictionary.com defines courage as the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, or pain. When I think about courage, I'm reminded of a story by Adrian Rogers, a famous pastor. He tells a story of a man that was bragging about cutting the tail off of a man-eating lion using just his pocket knife. And when the man was asked why he didn't also cut the head of the lion off as well, he said that someone had already beaten him to it. Joshua would need courage. Now, now, why is that? Well, remember, 40 years ago, Joshua was one of the 12 spies from Numbers 13 and 14, and Joshua had entered into the promised land. Remember that he took 40 days to explore the land? And remember the report that the spies brought back that, yes, the land had incredible fruit, and yes, it was a land flowing with milk and honey, but on the other hand, uh, there were giants in the land, it seemed, and there were not just cities, but large and fortified cities in the land. And, and, and this land would be very difficult to overtake. In fact, the people of God listened to those spies, to 10 of the 12 of those spies, and that's why they had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. But, but nonetheless, Joshua was one of those spies that entered into the promised land. He had already been witness to what was there. And in the midst of that, uh, Moses and, and God continually tell Joshua to be strong and courageous because they, they knew it was going to take strength and courage to lead God's people in the face of adversity. Well, we're living in a fearful time today, and we must be people who choose faith over fear. Undoubtedly, we know about the coronavirus or COVID-19. It was first detected in China and by now has been found in over 100 international locations. In fact, on January the 30th of this year, the World Health Organization declared an outbreak and they declared it a public health emergency of international concern. By March 11th, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, which is something that affects the entire world. President Trump declared the situation a national emergency. According to the CDC, the epicenter of the outbreak was Wuhan, China. It was there that at a large seafood and live animal market that COVID-19 was contracted by humans. And from there, it was transmitted human to human and it began to spread like wildfire. And some infected may suffer mild symptoms. Others have led to, to death. As of today of this recording, March 17th of 2020, there have been 4,226 cases in the United States alone. And of those cases, 75 have resulted in death. This includes 49 of our states. In our own backyard, we've seen this virus affect St. Louis, and now there's even a presumptive positive case in Franklin County. In response, our country has asked us to be wise and to be cautious, certainly, in our interaction. Most of the large sporting events and concerts and festivals have been postponed or canceled during this season. Schools have even been closed to the end of the month. 
Stores are running out of hand sanitizer and toilet paper, as you well know. We are living in times of fear. But we are not people of fear. The people of God do not fear the things of this world. The people of God do not fear even death because we are not made to be in this world forever. And we have a higher hope. His name is Jesus. Look again at Joshua chapter one, verse nine. Notice with me why we choose faith over fear. Joshua 1, 9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or be discouraged for the Lord. Your God is with you wherever you go. What is the opposite here of strength and courage? It is being afraid and it is being discouraged. And Joshua 1, 9 gives us the reason that we can have strength and courage. It is not because of our health care system. It is not because of our government. It is not just in our own general awareness. It is because the Lord, our God, is with us. The Lord is with us. And I don't know if you've ever had an experience that, that, that being in the presence of another person has, has, has given you courage and strength. But I have. When our teams were regularly going to Haiti, we would fly into Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and we would leave St. Louis at about 6 a.m., and we would get to Port-au-Prince at about 3.30 p.m. their time. It was a long day of travel. It was an exhausting day of travel, having a connecting flight in Atlanta, just trying to lead teams through all of the customs and immigrations. And when you get to Port-au-Prince and when you get to the airport there, you go through their customs and their security and their immigration. And, and you're just queued in lines with, with hundreds or thousands of other people. And it just makes for a very long day, especially at the end of the trip, you are already exhausted. And it's at that time that you go to the luggage claim after you've gotten through customs. And when you get to the luggage claim, it is beyond stressful because what's happening at the carousels is literally dozens of, of Haitians are there and they're already getting your bags off the carousels. They're already piling them together. Uh, they're offering your bag to you and, and they're doing it in such a way of saying, if you give me a tip, I will give you your bag. And it just makes everything so stressful because they're just trying everything that they can to earn a dollar. And some of these people looked official and they have a yellow vest on and others just are wearing regular clothes and you just can't tell who is official and who isn't official. It is beyond stressful. But once you find your luggage and, and once you, you assemble your team, then the most stressful part of all comes. You, you begin to walk out of the airport. And when you walk out of the airport, uh, there is there a corridor and you walk through the corridor and it's, it's like a large sidewalk with an awning. And lining the sides of the sidewalk, sitting on the rails, are literally hundreds of Haitian men and they're offering you rides to your destination. They're offering to take your bags. And by that, they're trying to take your bags out of your hand to take them to your transportation because they, they need tips. And it's so stressful. Uh, it, it, it can be frightening, in fact, if you've never been before because it, it's very aggressive. And so when I lead teams to Haiti, I'm already exhausted from a long day of travel, from a long day of leading those teams. And I come out into that corridor and all I can see is just walls of Haitians. But I'm specifically looking for a face that I recognize. And the face is the face of a man named Jono. And when I see Jono, I recognize him among all the other Haitians. When I see Jono's face, I'm just telling you, a feeling of joy comes over me. A feeling of relaxation comes over me. I can literally feel my stress decrease in the very moment that I see Jono. And I, I hug Jono and I say, thank you, God, that we've been able to meet with one another. And then Jono takes our bags and Jono leads our team. And as we're going out, he carries authority. And so much so that he waves away the people who were trying to help us and he makes them go back to their places and because they know that we are with Jono. And just being with him and being in his presence, 
It, it, it makes us stronger and it makes us more courageous than we have ever been. And, and why do we choose faith over fear? We can choose faith over fear because as God said to Joshua, I will be with you. Isn't that just comforting? In, during the, toward the end of Jesus' life and ministry in John 14, he's beginning to teach them about his Holy Spirit and how when he leaves this earth, he's going to send his Holy Spirit as a presence for his people. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 14. He says, and I will ask the father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. And he is the spirit of truth. And the world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you know him because he remains with you and he will be in you. So for us today, there's a greater word than even there was for Joshua. Because for Joshua, the Lord said, I will be with you as I've always been with Moses. I will be with you. But for us, Jesus says, not only will he be with us, but the Holy Spirit of God will be in us. And friends, that is a great reason to have strength. And courage. That's a great reason to not be dominated by fear or discouragement, knowing that we have an amazing and loving God who is in us. And so what do we do with this? Well, as believers, we believe that God has created us to have a relationship with him and that 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 relationship with him has been marred and broken by sin. And the reality is that, that you and I, if left on our own, we will, we will choose to do things that displease the Lord. We will choose to go our own way, and the Bible calls that sin. But there's good news, and the good news is that Jesus Christ came to this earth to pay the penalty and the price for our sin. In fact, John 3, 16, you know this well, says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus came and he gave his life on the cross. He was resurrected three days later and all who believe in him will be saved. And, and beyond that, he gives us the presence of his Holy Spirit. He, he makes us his dwelling place and he will be with us and in us. And so there is no need and no reason to fear. In a world that is panicking over a pandemic, in a world that's freaking out in fear, in a social media culture full of memes and ideologies and, and panic and pandemonium, we have a God who is with us we have a God who is in us. Now, I want to say that I don't know today your heart. I don't know even who's watching this video. I don't know where you might stand with the Lord. But I, what, I, what I want to share with you is that you can also live in strength and you can also live in courage. You can live without fear of this world. And you can do so by trusting in Jesus Christ. And today, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus and in him alone, I'm going to just encourage you to pray along with me. Uh, this prayer will be on the screen for you, but just pray this along with me. If you say, boy, I need to know Jesus Christ. Now understand we're not saying, uh, we're not talking about what church you go to, what denomination you're connected with. We're just asking the question, have you ever put your faith and trust in in Jesus Christ alone? Have you ever turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus? And if the answer is no, I just want to encourage you to pray along with me this prayer. It'll be on the screen. So let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I know that I have sinned and I know that my sin separates me from you. And I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Save me. I believe you died and rose again. And I want you to be my leader. 
And as much as I know how, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Well, the great news for you today is if you prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Bible also says in, verse, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that you are no longer who you used to be, but, but in Christ all things have been made new. And so I just want to encourage you today to tell somebody if you just surrendered your life to Jesus. And if you don't even know who to tell, there's a number at the bottom of the screen. Just text that number and say, today I believed. And we'll follow up with you to help you to know what to do from here in your walk with Jesus. But for the rest of us who already believe, here's the good news. God has given us the ball. I don't know if you've noticed already, but we're already in the game. And so in light of that, let's run together. Let's remember his faithfulness. Let's decide and choose faith over fear. In this pivotal time in our nation, let's shine bright for Jesus. Let's love him well. Hey, let's love our neighbors well. Let's find out how we can minister and serve and love on our community in ways that might be unprecedented. But the Lord is going to use this for his glory and for the good of his people. I pray at the end of the pandemic that we would not be like the Jim Marshalls of the world. That we wouldn't just take our ball and run the opposite direction. But that we would say, yes, Lord, we will walk with you. We have you with us. We have you in us. And we're going to do this and we're going to serve you and we're going to love you and we're going to love each other for the glory of God and for the glory of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the good of our people and for the good of the nations. Let's do this together. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Father, I pray this morning that you would find us faithful. God, as you've introduced this new rhythm into our lives of rest, as you've literally cleared our calendars from all the things we had to do, Lord, would we be making the most of our opportunity? Would we use this time in our lives to recalibrate our calendars and our lives so that we might most glorify you Lord, that we might enjoy your presence, that we might enjoy your company, that we might enjoy our friends and our family, Lord, that we might bring you glory. Father, we thank you that you're sovereign. We thank you that you're in control and that we can trust you. We thank you that your presence is with us, in us, right now and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Our hope doesn't rest in the, in the hands of the government or the CDC or the World Health Organization, but in the mighty hand of God. Lord, we love you. Guard us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today for a great time of worship together. Hey, we just want to remind you that over the next couple of weeks, we'll do our very best to communicate with you in a number of different ways. If you know of a need in your neighborhood or in your family or in a close circle that you have, would you please let us know simply by emailing us here at Faith. We're going to do our best to love our community during this season. And also, we want you to know that we have a great new text messaging service. So at the end of this video, we're going to throw up a slide with a number for that. So you can text in any type of prayer requests or additional ministry needs that you'd like for us to know about, either for you or for someone that you know in your life. I also just want to take a moment to remind you the importance of keeping up with that Foundations reading plan. Look, what hasn't been taken from us is the Word of God and prayer. And so I would encourage you every single day, devote yourself to those things. Keep up with the Foundations reading, even though you're not able to meet with your small group right now. I believe that day will come soon. And so stay up to date with that. Definitely check our website for additional updates. And we're also going to place at the end of this video a slide with various ways for you to give. You can mail your giving to us. You can give online through our website. You can use the Church Center app. You can also text to give. So there's a lot of great outlets for you, for you to use 
maybe some that you haven't used before. So whatever's most convenient for you, we're gonna provide a slide at the end of this video with that information for you to decide. Thanks for tuning in and we hope to see you guys soon.